Brilliant. Good morning, Tom. And um, thank you very much for giving some time to us uh, to talk to the Mint. Thanks for having me. Um, I was uh, learned about your uh, venture, TerraCycle, and thought it was absolutely fascinating and, and very exciting. I wonder if you could start by giving a bit of background about yourself and how you came up with the idea, how you got into the uh, TerraCycle in the first place. Sure. Um... Well, so I started TerraCycle in, uh, in college, uh, and uh, the idea came up in my freshman year, and then I left school in my sophomore year to pursue it, and that was 17 years ago. Uh, today, you know, it's grown to, we're now in 21 countries, uh, straight growth for all those years. But I think, you know, the, 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 the genesis for me, I was, uh, I was, you know, born in Budapest, which was still socialist or communist uh, when I was born there in 82, it was under the Iron Curtain, and then uh, we left uh, Budapest uh, in 86 when I was four, uh, just that's when Chernobyl happened, so the borders collapsed a little bit, allowed us to go, and landed in Canada after running around Europe a little bit, uh, and then went to college in the U.S., and I mentioned that genesis because going from, you know, communism to capitalism, uh, I fell in love with entrepreneurship. Uh, I think it's an amazing tool uh, for change uh, to, you know, to really affect the world. It's, it's, it's phenomenal. The big turning point for me when I came down to Princeton for college, I remember taking this class, uh, Economics 101. It was the first class uh, that I took at, at, at school, first lecture, first everything. And I remember going into the class and uh, the professor's first question was, what is the purpose of business? And I think it's a very appropriate opening question for Econ 101. Um, but the answer was really you know, uninspiring to me. The answer she was looking for was profit to shareholders. And while I think profit is incredibly important, um, I don't think that's the purpose of why businesses exist. You know, I think if you look at most stakeholders, uh, customers, uh, vendors, uh, even employees, when they interact with a business, that is not the driver for them. It's probably more of what the driver is, is what does that business do for the world or society? And so that got me on a personal mission to try to, you know, because I was loving entrepreneurship so much to try to create a business that uh, put purpose first and then profit as an important but second question. And uh, uh, garbage to me became the topic because it's one of the most fascinating things I've, uh, I've ever, you know, fascinating topic. So first, it's something we completely ignore because I think we're repulsed by it, you know, just, you know, like uh, we're repulsed by the waste we put in a toilet, we're repulsed by waste as a category. So it's not taught at schools. Uh, it is, uh, you know, undesired for people to go there. That's why the field is relative to its scale, uninnovative. Um, but it is massive. I mean, everything, you know, you see in, in your room or the room I'm sitting in, every object will one day belong to the garbage industry with no exception. So for how big it is, it's incredibly uninnovative. And I felt that was a great opportunity to, uh, to uh, create a business around it and uh, really think about how do we change some of the rules on waste and behave differently with waste. So what did you aim to do and how did you decide that was the place to intervene? That was the thing that you could make a difference with? So TerraCycle first began by trying to be a consumer product company, uh, making uh, products uh, out of waste and packaging them in waste. In fact, our first product was organic waste fed to worms. They would then uh, eat it and poop out worm poop. And we took that worm poop, liquefied it, like making a tea, and then packaged that in used soda bottles. And that was actually our first uh, entree, our first business model. Um, we were able to, you know, within four years, scale that up to about a $6 million size. So, you know, it was working. But we realized that we wouldn't accomplish our mission uh, by being a consumer product good company making products out of waste. You know, our mission is to eliminate the idea of waste. And if you make products out of waste, then you're going to pick the very best waste out there uh, and not pick really difficult things like we do today, like dirty diapers, cigarette butts, you know, things of that nature. And so about four years into our business, we pivoted to effectively what TerraCycle does today, which is not to make products from waste, but to start with the waste as the question and then figure out how to collect it, how to process it and how to turn it into uh, something new um, and uh, to really become sort of a service engine to try to uh, eliminate the idea of waste uh, through recycling things that are hard to recycle by integrating waste back into consumer products like ocean plastic into shampoo bottles and even to move products from being single use to reusable all different services and systems that allow us to move to a waste free world and what was your biggest challenge out of interest in terms of something to recycle um, you know, when you look at, uh, in our first model, the TerraCycle, how do you recycle things that are hard to recycle? You have to answer three questions, really. Uh, and each waste stream, these answers may be different. The so first question is, how do we collect it? So how we collect dirty diapers will be very different than how we collect pens. 
Then the second is how do we process it? We look at can it be reused, upcycled, or recycled? And again, whether you compare a pen to a diaper, the way we recycle them is very different, very different technology and science that had to be developed. The third question, though, is actually the most important question, which is how do we get someone to fund it? Because you know, to collect and recycle pens or re collect and recycle dirty diapers, it will cost more to do that than the results are worth. So the, result, the resulting uh, recycled material is a subsidy on the program, but not uh, enough to cover all the costs. And in fact, that's what makes something not recyclable. Uh, you know, the reason an aluminum can is recyclable is because the value of the aluminum is high enough to fund the cost of collection and processing. Yeah. And inversely, why a toothbrush uh, is not recyclable, uh, or many other things. In fact, 80% of all goods fall into the non-recyclable realm, and that's the case when it costs more to collect and process and the results are worse. So the third question is very important, which is how do we get someone to want to fund this? Could be a brand who made it, could be a retailer who sold it, could be a city. And that becomes how do you drive a business model around it and drive other points of value beyond just the uh, recovered materials. So why do these people fund you to recycle their sure. products? Yeah. Yeah, it's a good question. So let me give you a couple of examples. Um, you know, with uh, uh, let's take a brand example. So I mentioned uh, diapers. Pampers funds our diaper recycling program that is today live in Amsterdam and will be scaling to a few other countries next year. And they fund it for a number of reasons. One is because consumers will nav uh, uh, choose Pampers more than a competitive brand if Pampers has a recycling platform, uh, while the others would not. So it's a way to drive brand loyalty and market share. Um, it's also, uh, you know, something that there's a lot of, you know, uh, talk uh, uh, out there now about passing laws around uh, diaper, um, uh, you know, diaper responsibility, especially in Europe. So this is a way to react to that pending legislation. Um, it drives a lot. It even drives uh, incremental value with their retail partners, giving them more favorable shelf space and so on. So it's all these different factors that would have, say, a pamper say it's a good idea to invest and fund diaper recycling. And does, uh, do, have Pampers changed the design of their products to make them more recyclable, make it easier and cheaper for you to recycle? So it's a good question. I think most brands are very focused on trying to design their products and packages into the local recycling systems that exist today. So that is the first goal. The first goal is not to partner with TerraCycle. The first goal is to um, design into existing recycling platforms. The challenge uh, of that is that recycling is, is, is not doing well as an industry. It's actually declining, not, not increasing. And the palette of what is locally recyclable is exceptionally limited. So it's not even technically possible today to make a diaper that would fit local recycling. Uh, it would just not be, uh, the design uh, would not be available. Um, uh, so that's where they work with a company like TerraCycle, uh, you know, where we can effectively collect and recycle almost anything. Um, but uh, if they could design into local recycling, that would be prime, you know, absolutely the preferred path. But do they redesign for you so it's easier for you to recycle them? Oh, they, they tend not to need to. Um, uh, uh, the, the investment for them of designing something that's easier for us to recycle uh, wouldn't be worth the benefit that we could pass along, right? So, um, you know, uh, imagine, you know, if you spent a huge amount of money redesigning a diaper to be a little bit easier for me to recycle, the extra cost savings that that would bring uh, from us wouldn't be worth that investment. So the real design step is not to design into TerraCycle because we can effectively do just about anything. It's to design into local municipal recycling that's available. Okay, and just take that example of diapers because I mean, I know there's a huge debate about sure. the environmental impacts of disposable diapers as opposed to cloth nappies or variants. Yeah. And I think there's yeah. been a certain amount of uh, innovation there as well. I mean, I suppose people might say, well, uh, you by helping recycle um, these diapers, encouraging people to use more than a cloth nappy that needs washing, which probably I think has lower impact. Overall, are you still having a positive effect? Uh, it's a good question. So just if we take diapers, uh, there have been life cycle analyses done on uh, multi-use diapers, like cloth diapers versus disposable ones. And uh, the punchline is if a consumer washes 
cloth diapers at home, they are absolutely worse from an LCA point of view, life cycle analysis point of view, than a disposable diaper. Where cloth diapers can, uh, in some cases, be better is if it's a system that where you have centralized industrial washing, um, then in some cases it may become more uh, beneficial uh, than a disposable one. So just to make sure that's very clear uh, from a, a life cycle analysis. But uh, I know, actually, funny enough, I was working at the Environment Agency when uh, in the UK who did mm -hmm. such a life cycle analysis, actually, mm -hmm. in um, mm -hmm. I think it was about 2008, 2007, something like that. And actually, it was hugely disputed because, of course, the other thing that the a key assumption was was whether um, the uh, the non-disposable diapers were dried outside. <laughs> oh yeah, dry in the drying machine. machine. Yes, um, and the, there's a lot of different sort of variables, aren't there? Um, they are. They are, and I think the punchline on this, because uh, I, I couldn't agree with you more, is that if you look at a cloth diaper, the question is. How do you wash and dry it is the primary yeah. point of impact. And uh, if you wash in hot water or cold water, if you put the diapers along with your clothing or run an independent load, and then how you dry the diapers, do you dry them indoor or outdoor? So I would say that there's a lot of factors that affect that, but I haven't addressed your question directly. So let me try to address it because you're asking is if Pampers does a diaper recycling program with TerraCycle, does that let them off the hook? Is that a well, fair let's, interpretation? Because sort of, um, I don't want to get too technical because I know you could have endlessly trying to compare it, but I'm just thinking, putting hmm. this into a broader context, you have a model that, which relies on getting people who are producing stuff and selling mm -hmm. it, mm -hmm. paying you to recycle it so that they can sell more stuff. And I looked at um, your website, and of course you have a bit of advice that says, uh, actually, First, you just think whether you really should have stuff or not um, and think whether you need all this stuff. That's a better result. But presumably no one's paying you to try and encourage people to buy less stuff. Sure, you're precisely right. So look, I think the number one thing as consumers we need to do is check our relationship with consumption and try to buy less. For sure, no question, everything, that is the best thing to do. Then, uh, uh, you're, you're correct, you know, there's no business models around buying less. So we try to promote that as much as we can uh, outside the context of our business models, wherever we have a platform, like speaking to you today, or to, uh, on our website and so on. With consumer product companies and retailers, you know, who are in the business of selling stuff, right? There, where we can really have something that they will take seriously and scale is to bring recycling solutions where they don't exist, and to shift them, that's through TerraCycle, and then through Loop to shift them from single-use products and packages to multi-use products and packages. So to be very clear, not buying is better than any of that, but within the context of buying, let's at least try to make sure those things are recyclable uh, or uh, reusable. I'm just sort of interested because obviously you're a social business and your yes. purpose is core. And, I, and, and if you look, you know, we go to the bigger picture still and we see that the overall economy is heading to about four degrees and yes. really we need to be below one and a half. And of course, part of this, of course, is that no one seems to be able to cope with uh, out economic growth and, uh, and stuff and, and this model that you and I, of course, are, are yes. all trapped to some extent within. And I wonder, I mean, you, you said there's no business model to fund stopping people, uh, you know, encourage people not to buy stuff. So do you think by making yourself a social enterprise as such, does that limit you even if you have the, but because you're, you can't do, you can only do stuff where you can find a business model, can't you? That's correct, yes. Yeah. So yes, within the context of business, we are limited to helping uh, 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 business models that are in the business of selling stuff do that more sustainably or more circularly. You're precisely correct. With that said, what's sort of interesting is that as we get bigger um, uh, and have a bigger platform, and just speaking to you today, this is a platform where I don't have to be focused on just business. I can speak to you as we are about anything. And in such platforms, uh, writing books, you know, we have our own TV show, you know, uh, uh, talking to journalists, um, we can there spread the message, uh, which is the one that doesn't have a business model around it, which is the idea of buying less. So I'd say there are two actors in this overall equation. There are the consumers and there are the businesses. Consumers uh, should first think about how do we not buy things and avoid consumption 
And then if we do need to buy things uh, like food to feed ourselves or clothing to clothe ourselves and so on, then let's do that in the most uh, uh, sustainable and circular opportunities. As it pertains to business, just to sort of quickly finish yeah. here, as it pertains to the business side, businesses have a almost impossible time promoting uh, not buying. There's a few examples like Patagonia saying, don't buy this jacket. But that, that is a very difficult thing for a business to actually put out there and get approval for and get funding for. And so there, uh, what actors can do pragmatically today to make the world a better place is to make linear business models significantly more circular. You know, and those are, the way I look at it is, look, I mean, let, let, let's take another example. Let's take something we can all agree should not exist, cigarettes, right? I think it's a, that's an easy one society can all agree. We could have a debate on whether diapers should exist, but I think it's more black and white on cigarettes. So let's pick that example. If you work at a Philip Morris or a Imperial Tobacco or a BAT, any of these large tobacco companies, um, uh, and you, you know, or I went into one of them, they're all partners of ours, right? So if I went in and said, you should just stop selling cigarettes, the world would be better for it nothing would happen. We'd get kicked out of the room at the end or uh, you know, the idea wouldn't be listened to. But if I can go in and convince them to stop spending some money on you know, traditional promotion and put that into uh, cigarette recycling, that's at least a step uh, 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 in a better direction than just you know, putting out commercials that have people consume more. One, I was just going to pick up uh, on one word. You talked about consumers. And I suppose yes. one of the things uh, that people are looking at is trying to drop the uh, talking about people like that because talk about them as citizens uh, mm. and empowering them really to look beyond their consumption activities and see themselves in a broader uh, context if you like and I wonder in terms of um, you obviously you get a lot of publicity and you talk on platforms and, and so on have you found ways to try and pull people more in or engage people or, or get them more into the debate and, and, and so forth beyond I suppose the sound bites or the, the, the nice story or whatever. Um, I, I, I don't quite follow, sorry, I don't quite understand the, the, the question. Do you mind rephrasing it perhaps? Well, what I'm thinking is that um, a lot of social um, enterprises, I suppose, also can be community businesses. Mm, and yeah, yeah. They, their strategy is less about um, being part of the economy and moving stuff around and more about trying to bring people into a debate and a discussion and get them engaged and, uh, and, and really, I suppose, about systems change. Because, I mean, you could say that you're a bit like the sort of NHS, you know, our health service, which people joke is actually the sickness service. Um, <laughs> in that you only go to, you only get health service if you're really ill and you then live a little bit longer and then yeah. and die a bit older. And no one, bothers about or there's very little effort or time etc put into um, being healthy helping people be healthy in the first place and I suppose you could say TerraCycle is sort of the sickness in you know, trying to make a slightly less sick in a sick economy if you like that is pushing mm -hmm. through lots of stuff and rather than trying to change the actual economic system itself or am I being unfair would you say is, is no no I think you're being very fair. Thank you for rephrasing. I think you're being very fair to the question. And you're right. You know, uh, partners would only partner, companies uh, would only partner with TerraCycle if they have problems, right? If they're, you know, uh, 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 to make themselves more circular. So the people are coming to us to solve uh, uh, challenges, right? For sure. Um, you know, and, and it's a good, you know, we do have uh, uh, a lot of different ways that we create sort of the consciousness around this topic, uh, you know, uh, through our social media channels. You know, we have groups coming through our office all the time for tours, whether it's schools or businesses. We get invited to companies to talk about not just how to implement our service, but to rethink how to think uh, uh, or how to implement a circular economy into their organization. So we do a tremendous amount of that type of thinking. You know, I, I'm giving lectures all the time, written books on this topic. Um, you know, the most recent one, Future of Packaging, is all about people reading it to understand why do we get into this mess to begin with and how do we get our way out of it. So everything we do almost, you know, uh, where we can have the opportunity to get the message out there uh, 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 around the overall issue where, frankly, the solution is, you know, buy less and, and, uh, and so on. We do. There's no question. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but just like any other social business, that is not the core, right? So take, you know, Ben and Jerry's. They're, uh, you know, both Ben and Jerry are close friends of mine. They built an amazing ice cream company that has a lot of social purpose. But 99% of their employees exist to sell and make ice cream. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. And then 1% or less exist to promote, you know, the social causes that they try to attach the ice cream to, which are incredibly important. And so if you look at resource, right, most of the resource of any social business that is thriving, I would challenge you to show me any other, any exemption to this rule needs to focus on its business and to make that business as, as uh, robust as possible. And then the more it does that, the more it can dedicate to uh, the, the type of activities that don't drive revenue, but drive just the cause. Brilliant. Well, thank you very much, Tom. That's been really interesting. And thank you very much for giving the time. Um, and I wish you all the best in, in your uh, campaign to raise an awareness and uh, move the system to a better place. Well, I really appreciate your time. It's great to connect and look forward to chatting at the next opportunity. Thanks very much, Tom. Great. Cheers. Talk to you soon.